was back in Thailand, we had a sudden death in the monastery. They were constructing the Buddha image and having a cement pouring. The scaffolding was very tall, and a woman fell from the scaffolding, broke her neck, died instantly. And that night we had our regular evening chant, and the chant was, of course, this one that we did just now. Subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death, subject to separation. We're the owners of our karma. And it was something we chatted many, many times. And it suddenly took on new meaning that night. It applied to a specific person, a specific event, that it still was sending a shockwave through the community. This is an important part of the teaching. It prepares you. It gives you ways to think about events in life so you can handle them. So they don't have to knock you off balance. So an important part of the meditation is, on the one hand, gaining a solid center for the mind, as when you focus it on the breath. Another important part, though, are these re reflections we have. They help you think your way through difficult emotions, difficult situations. Which is why the reflections are an important part of the meditation, why we have the chance every night before we meditate. It helps to put things into perspective. so that we're not suddenly caught short, or surprised, or shocked. There may be the shock of an individual person's passing. But you have to remember, if you've been reflecting long enough, this is the way of the world. Some people say the Buddha is pessimistic in talking about these things, but he's actually preparing you. If we don't talk about them, how are you going to handle these events when they come? How can you get a perspective so that you can still continue to do and say and think the skillful thing, given the situation? So as you're chanting these things, don't just go through the motions. Remind yourself, this is important preparation for how to think about difficult things in life. Like this reflection on aging, illness, and death. There are two ways of doing it. One is like the chant just now. It's about yourself. You're reflecting about where you've been, where you're going. And the Buddha said, this is important because it helps develop a sense of heedfulness, that you've really got to be careful about what you do and you say and you think. Because these are the things you carry with you, these habits. And if you learn to be careful, then the time comes when suddenly you find yourself confronted with aging, illness, and death. You learn to do the careful thing. You learn to think the careful way. You learn to train your mind with the proper care so that you don't start focusing on harmful emotions harmful behavior patterns, that you realize, okay, aging, illness, and death have come. What do I have left? Well, I still have my actions. Make sure they're skillful. Or if you find yourself suddenly too sick to do things, well, don't focus on what you can't do. Focus on what you can. This applies in all these situations. As you get older, focus on what you still can do. And when you're getting sick, focus on what you still can do. Even as you're dying, there are things that you can do. This is what's special about the Buddhist teachings. It gives you very clear guidelines on how to control your mind. There's practice of concentration, developing concentration, developing discernment. These are precisely the skills you're going to need as death happens. So 
to remind yourself no matter what happens in life, no matter how bad things get, there's always a skillful response. And that you benefit, and the people around you benefit as you try to find that response and act on it. The second way of using these reflections is to remind yourself it's not just you, everybody. is subject to aging, illness, death, and separation. Everybody is subject to their actions. As the Buddha said, when you reflect in this way, it's not just a matter of becoming heedful. You develop a sense of sangwega. That no matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter how good things can get in life, these things always lie in wait. You can become a deva. You can become a brahma. They are still subject to death. They are still subject to their actions. When you reflect in this way, it should motivate you to get out of the process altogether. In other words, start focusing on what they call the karma that puts an end to karma. The Buddha didn't teach just about good or bad karma. He said basically there are four kinds of karma altogether. There's good karma in the normal sense of the things you do and say and think that are going to lead to a good rebirth, and also just plain old happiness in the rest of this life. Then there are the bad things, bad karma, the things that are going to create misery within the process of samsara. And then there are mixed actions, which are a combination of skillful and unskillful intentions. And then finally, he said, there's the karma that puts an end to karma. That, he says, is the Eightfold Noble Path, or another explanation, it's the seven factors for awakening. In other words, the actions you can do that lead to release. This is one of the very special consequences of the Buddhist teachings on causality. Some people say, well, if you act in a con do condition things, you're constantly going to be subject to conditions, you can never reach the unconditioned. The only way out would be not to act at all. But the Buddha said, that's not the case. There are actions you can do, things you can do that take you to places where the whole system of samsara, the whole system of intentions breaks down, where you get undefined in terms of those systems. You can do things that get you there. And so when you reflect on the universality of aging, illness, and death, separation, and the principle of karma, that should motivate you to try to get out of the whole system entirely. In other words, these two types of reflection correspond to what's called mundane right view and transcendent right view. Mundane right view focuses on karma. and rebirth, and the value of, on the one hand, generosity, and on the other hand, gratitude. Most of us, when we first hear the teachings on karma, tend to think about punishment. You hear that you're going to suffer from the results of your past bad actions, and that's what the first thing that comes to us is, oh my God, that thing I did in the past when I hurt that person or did this thing I know was wrong, it's going to come back and get me. That's our normal first thought about the teaching on karma, but that's not what the Buddha emphasizes when he teaches karma. He starts with reflecting on the gratitude we owe to people who have helped us, because they actually did something. It wasn't that they were acting under determined forces that forced them to help us. They made the choices to help us. We owe them gratitude, particularly our parents. And then also the principle of generosity. The decision to give something is a genuine decision. It's genuinely good. So these are the two principles that the Buddha asked you to act on as you try to navigate your way in this world. So at the very least, you can have a comfortable life this time around and can expect something comfortable next time around.
That's mundane right view. Transcendent right view focuses on the Four Noble Truths. Seeing how even a good rebirth and a good identity are still bound up in suffering. And so instead of thinking in terms of your identity, about who's doing the action, who's going to receive the results of the action, just look purely at action in terms of cause and effect. What kinds of action lead to suffering? What kinds of actions are that fourth kind of karma, the karma that leads to the end of karma? As we practice, we switch back and forth between these two modes of viewing the world. We need the first in order to get to the second. Let's work on making your actions more skillful, less harmful. Develop a good, strong sense of irresponsibility, what they call a good, healthy self. A sense of being responsible, learning how to sacrifice immediate pleasures for long-term pleasures, developing a sense of what really is your duty and what's, I'd say, other people's duty is that you don't have to get involved with. In this case, the sense of self is important. It's a useful strategy for focusing your attention on what really needs to be done. But at the same time, the Buddha wants you to develop transcendent right view. Look at things simply in terms of cause and effect, skillful cause leading to the end of suffering, unskillful cause leading to suffering. In this way of looking at things, it doesn't require a sense of self. Just looking at actions and their results. And over time, you find yourself leaning more and more in the direction of that second level of right view, the transcendent right view. Because that's the kind of view that can liberate you from old patterns of action that are unskillful. Helps you deal with things coming up in the mind, so you don't have to identify with a particular feeling, a particular emotion, a particular way of doing things. You can evaluate it simply in terms of whether it's skillful or not. And if you're doing this when the mind is well concentrated, and you have a sense of well-being that comes from staying consistently with the breath. It's a lot easier to let go of those old, unskillful patterns. With increasing levels of subtlety, until finally you get released from the whole thing. So these are some reflections that help us get focused on the practice help us deal with events as they come up in our lives, but also give us a strong sense of what we're doing and where we're going. And that right there is an important part of keeping things in perspective, otherwise we get swamped by the events of the world. Forget there is a way out. People have found the way out and they found true happiness in the course of taking that way out. One other thing that's important to notice about these reflections is that the Buddha has you focus first on your own personal narrative. Before he has you sit down and meditate, though, he has you reflect on the universality of these principles. It's strange that when you're bound up in your own personal suffering, when you reflect on the universality of the process, everybody's suffering from aging, illness, death, and separation. It takes a lot of that personal sting out of the, the problem. So you don't feel that you're especially bad or especially being punished. This is just a universal principle throughout the universe. Everybody suffers these things. Even in other galaxies, the same process goes holds true. When you think in this way, it gets a lot easier to come to the present moment with a healthy attitude. This follows the pattern of the Buddha's awakening.
those three knowledges on the night of his awakening. The first knowledge was knowledge of his own past lives, tracing things back, back, back for countless aeons. The second knowledge was more universal, seeing how everybody dies and is reborn in line with their karma. Seeing the universality, he also saw the principle of karma. That became more and more prominent. And karma basically comes down to the intentions that are shaped by your attention, in other words, your views, the way you look at things. So it was with this more universal principle, this more universal perspective, that he then approached the present moment in the third knowledge of the night. and was able to look at the present moment simply in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Follow the duties appropriate to each of the truths, in other words, comprehending suffering, letting go of the cause, realizing the cessation of suffering, and developing the path to the end, to the cessation of suffering. He was able to do this skillfully because he had looked at the universal picture first. So when the events of your life are weighing you down, try to look at that more universal principle. Get perspective on things. That makes it easier to bring transcendent right view to what you're doing right now. So as we chant these reflections, we do it many, many times, and so there's the danger that it becomes mechanical. The advantage, of course, is that these thoughts become familiar. So focus on the advantage. You've got a familiar way of thinking that can help you through all kinds of dangers. And so as you go through the chants, don't do it just mechanically. Try to reflect on them. The more wisely you can reflect, the more prepared you are for whatever comes up. 